Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. We appreciate the fact you're with us here in the Northside Baptist Church this morning. May God bless you. We welcome everyone. We welcome any visitor that might be visiting with us. And you out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium here in the Northside Baptist Church. And this is Preacher Edwards speaking. And you in the radio listening audience can do us a real favor if you get on your phone and call a friend, have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. we we'll try to be an inspiration to as many as possible. We appreciate it. Now take your Bible, will you please, and turn to 2 Kings chapter 7 by the reading of God's Word. 2 Kings chapter 7, page 429 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Now I want you to be here this evening at 6 o'clock for the evening service. We have some wonderful evening services. You enjoy good singing. And we appreciate you what thus saith the Lord our God. And we want you to come get in on the good service, good fellowship. And we want to see you here at 6 this evening. And then on Wednesday night at 7.30 for Bible study and prayer meeting. We're making a study of the book of Acts on Wednesday nights. And the Lord is blessing. And we're having a wonderful time together in the study of God's word. Now keep this announcement in mind, on Monday the 18th of this month, we begin a meeting here at Northside on Monday night through Friday night. Brother Gary Montgomery, the pastor of the Gateway Baptist Church in Bristol, Tennessee, will be our visiting speaker. Now Brother Gary is a great and outstanding preacher. You'll enjoy him. Every message, he'll help you. And I want you to plan to be here. Start planning right now. Don't make any plans to keep you away from this meeting. If you have to switch shifts or whatever, uh, you come and get in on this meeting. It'll only be five nights. And then I want you right now to start working on your neighbors, on your relatives, and get them to promise to be in the meeting. Start making phone calls and do everything you can to Make the meeting a great success, but by all means, if you have your name on this church roll, you be here for the meeting. We're counting on you, and we don't have too many meetings because of a lot of people don't see be interesting in attending meetings anymore. They should be, and the more interesting we become and the greater meetings we have, the more meetings we can have. So I hope you'll be here that we'll have a good meeting Coming up beginning the 18th of this month, only just about a couple of weeks away, so you keep this in mind. Write in and get one of our brochures on our proposed Holy Land tour. We're planning one of the greatest tours yet. We plan to go to Israel for eight days and visit wonderful places there in Israel. Take a ride on the Sea of Galilee. Go to the Garden Tomb where they buried Jesus. Go to Mount Calvary where he was crucified. Go to the upper room where the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Visit the Dead Sea and various other places. And then after we leave Israel, we plan to go to Geneva, Switzerland. There's no country any more beautiful than the land of Switzerland. You heard about these Swiss watches. If you go, maybe you can get you a good watch. And to see the beautiful country of Switzerland and go to Geneva, Switzerland, will be a real trip within itself. And we're going on the Swift Airlines, the safest today, and then going to Israel, one of the safest places in the land today. And then, of course, Switzerland is a safe place. We're not worried about the terrorists. As I've told you some time ago, there's only been about five people killed in the Middle East this year, where there's been 464 killed in the city of New York. And so you see, you're in more danger in some of the large cities in America than you are in the Middle East at the present time. And write in and get the brochure. If you're out today and your pastor's never been, then start making plans to send him. Now I have 240 cassette tapes listed here. I have the list, 240. You can get these tapes for $3 each, and the gift helps us to take care of our radio expense. You have such tape as do people in heaven know what's going here on here on the earth? Wicked and angry demons, uh, the why worry, worry what? The torments of hell, the revival of the Antichrist, 
and many other uh, tapes listed, some 240. Write in and get a list. Just say, Preach Edward, send me a list of your tape, and you can order them by number or by title. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. So you write to me next week. We are working together in getting out the gospel. My mail has been greatly off in the past uh, week or so during vacation time and hot summer days. And we'd like to hear from you, the listener, if you love God, love this ministry. God lets us live to the last day of this month and continue on the air that long. We'll complete 38 years of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, Georgia. So you can see this is not a fly-by-night ministry. It's been a great inspiration to multitudes. Thousands of people have been blessed by this radio broadcast and being blessed today. People are right now listening in the hospitals, in prison cells, and various other places. They're listening today to the sound of my voice right now. And you that keep this program on there make this possible. God puts it on your record in heaven. And God will take care of you at the judgment seat of Christ for what you have done to help do this whole mission work. May God bless you as you do so. You know there's days when seemingly everything goes wrong, nothing goes right. Sometimes you not only find days like that, you find weeks like that. I'm reminded of this little city slicker that he saw some men out pruning some trees. He said, now that's a manly job. I think I'll uh, get me a job pruning trees. I'm getting tired of the desk and staying in the office all the time. I want to be a manly, outdoor kind of a feller. And he went out and applied for a job, and they gave him the job and gave him some snips or saws or whatever you use to climb up in the trees to cut the limbs off. He wasn't up there but just a few minutes until he cut his hand. And when he cut his hand, it kind of scared him. He panicked and fell out of the tree. And when he came down on the sidewalk, he fell on top of a man. And the man thought it was somebody going to mug him and rob him. So this man gave him a good uppercut and landed him out against a taxi coming down the street, right in the side of that taxi. That taxi bounced him back on the sidewalk and then he took off and ran through a man's yard, and before he got through the yard good, a dog took out the seat of his pants, and he just kept on moving with scratched body and bruised legs, and he decided that things wasn't going exactly right, and that wasn't his kind of job. See, you've got to have a propensity toward whatever you do, or you'll never be able to get it done. That little boy that sat at the typewriter Never would make a pruner to be able to prune trees. And things didn't go wrong. So there may be times in a period of testing that you may be stronger, that you might use you in a greater way on down the road. So just uh, look up and keep moving on for God. Now I hope you found Second Kings 7. I'm going to speak on the subject, the day of good tidings. Second Kings chapter 7. We find here that there's a terrible drought hit the land there in Samaria. A terrible drought and the Assyrians had come to capture Samaria and they surrounded the little city of Samaria and wouldn't let people in or out. They decided they'd starve them out. In those days they had walls around their cities and many times they had to starve the people out in order to conquer their little city, cities. And so they were trying to do this. Now that drought had come, people starving to death, even uh, eating their own children and eating uh, uh, anything they could get to eat. And so they, they want starvation. Now the old king of Israel blamed every bit of that on the preacher. He said, oh, Elisha, he's responsible for all of this. I'm going to take his head off his shoulders. I, I'm not going to let this day get by. With old Elisha's head on his shoulder, I'm going to uh, take his head off. I don't like him, and he's to blame for all of this drought and all the starvation and what's going on here in Samaria. Now, many times the man of God gets blamed for things that he shouldn't be blamed for, and that's the case here. And so they went to Elijah. They sent a, 
a little group to him to see what he could do about the situation. And they found the man of God at home. And look at chapter 7 verse 1. They came to talk to him about the droughts in the land, about the starvation of the people. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord will make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the inner end of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? And we say we will enter into the city. Then the family is in the city, and we shall die there. If we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel had hide against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, we do not well this day is a day of good tidings and we'll hold our peace. If we turn to the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Now these lepious men, they said the day is a day of good tidings. That's what I'm speaking about today. And this tape will be tape number 241. 241, the day of good tidings. A great famine in the land. A man of God is blamed for the famine. A man of God like Elijah of old. Elijah was blamed for a terrible famine for three and a half years or one occasion. Now Elisha is being blamed for a famine. In Old Testament days in God dealing with Israel, many times God would send a great drought. He'd withhold the rain. Famines would come. You know today here in the southeast we are suffering a terrible drought. We don't know why. We're suffering this drought. God knows, but we don't. But in those days, they blamed the preacher. I don't know who they're blaming today about the drought here in southeast Georgia. Maybe some people might be blaming the preachers. I don't know. But notice number one, the gospel in this story. Now, the gospel means good news. They had found some food in the camp of the Assyrians. The Assyrians had fled and left all of their food and their belongings and run like folk in lightning because they thought the Sumerian king had uh, gathered together Hittites and the king of Egypt and their armies to chase them and overcome them. They took off. Now God caused them to think this and God created a certain kind of noise that sounded exactly like that. Now the good news, the gospel, now like this doomed and perishing city, the world lies in the power of the evil one. It is under wrath. And in it are guilty, people are guilty, under sin and ready to perish. Now, these people here in Samaria, they were starving. They were about to perish, many of them dying. Some had eaten their own children and various other things they ate, and the Bible tells us. And then when these lepers found out about the goods left in the tents when they went down to check on them, they said, this is good news, and they believed the good news, and so they uh, uh, carried the good news back. Now, we need to realize that God is able to take care of his own and take care of every need. I reminded the dear woman many years ago up here in Michigan. There this uh, woman, uh, they found a little baby boy out in the cold, 
Somebody had left the little boy out in the cold. Little thing froze to death. It's just a few months old. And this lady had a little boy of her own. And she always referred to her little boy, my little baby boy. And that night she got to thinking about that little baby boy out there that someone had left. They didn't care for it. They didn't love it anymore. And they starved to death, or froze to death, rather. And she said, I have a little baby boy. And said, I wouldn't want my little boy to be just buried in any manner. I'm going and see what I can do about burying this little child. So she went to the mortuary and claimed the body. And she got somebody to pay for a little coughing. And she got somebody to uh, pay for some flowers. And she got someone to get a cemetery lot. And she got someone to dig the grave. And there she buried that little boy. She didn't know the child. Didn't know who its mother was or its dad. But she knew it was a loving little child. And she knew Jesus loved that little child. And so she um, had the little baby buried with honor. And then she erected a little tombstone. And on that little tombstone, she put these words. Jesus loves little baby boy. Jesus loves little baby boy. Now God is concerned about those who are in need and those who are suffering. And he was concerned about the people here in this city that were starving to death. And we need to realize that God is concerned about people. Number two, the word of the Lord stands true, though men do not believe it. Now in 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 1, Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. The preacher said, Just be patient. Tomorrow about this time there will be some food here at the gate of Samaria. Why, well, the old king didn't believe that. Nobody believed that. The man of God believed it. And he said, Tomorrow at this time there will be food here at the gate of Samaria. That's our second thought. And then thought number three is a terrible result of unbelief. Now the old king here had a man that was overseer there in the village. And the king left everything up to him. And in verse 2 the Bible said, Then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord shall make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And in verse 20, And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. Now here the Lord, the man in charge of the village, when Elisha, the man of God, said there'd be some food here at the gate of Samaria tomorrow, why, he said, we don't believe a word of it. We don't believe that can happen. We, we just don't believe there'd be any food here. Elisha said, let me tell you something, buddy. He said there'd be some food here tomorrow, but you won't eat a bite of it. You're so filled with unbelief that you'll not eat one meal that'll be here at this gate tomorrow. And sure enough, the next day when the food was brought in, that such a crowd of hungry, starving people ran to get that food that they ran over this man, was in charge, the Lord of the group there, and, and trampled him to death. And he didn't get one bite of that food, not one. He was filled with unbelief. He didn't believe it could be done. Now, no doubt I'm speaking to someone today, you're filled with unbelief. You don't believe it can be done. Maybe you've been praying for something that hasn't happened yet, and the devil is telling you it just won't happen. The devil is telling you it just won't be done. The devil is trying to discourage you and knock you out to stop you from believing and praying and standing yet before God. Don't give up. The Bible said you reap if you faint not. Just hold on, knock on God's door till God opens the door. Sit on God's doorstep until God comes to your rescue. Don't give up. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do is to give up. The late Bishop Moore used to be a bishop in the Methodist Church around Atlanta. And in those days, in the days when he preached, the Methodist preachers believed something and preached something. I'm sorry most of them don't do that anymore. They preach a little social gospel, let people die and go to hell without God. But in those days, Bishop Moore preached the gospel. And he traveled many miles on a train to get to his meetings. And he was on a train traveling one time and... And he saw a restless young man just kept walking up and down the aisle. Walking up and down the aisle. Finally, 
Bishop Moore said, son, said, uh, I noticed you're kindly restless. Said, could I be any help to you? I'm a minister of the gospel. My name's Bishop Moore, and I'd be glad to help you. I've been preaching the gospel for many years. And can I help you, son? The little boy said, well, let, let me talk to you. And the boy sat down. He said, sir, it's like this. Said, me and my daddy couldn't get along. Said, we fussed and quarreled, almost fought, and we just couldn't get along at all. And said, I just left home uh, several months ago. And said, uh, since I left home, my mother's been writing me quite often, begging me to come back home. But he said, I've been somewhat afraid to go back after the turbo conflict between me and my dad. I'm just actually afraid. I'm afraid I would not be welcome if I went back home. And he said, now I wrote, my mother wrote me and then I wrote her back and I said, mother, if you hang a white flag out on the apple tree near the railroad track, when we pass by the house just before we get to the depot, I'll see that white flag and I'll know I'm welcome back home. And he said, preacher, we are almost there and I'm scared to death. Said, I'm afraid that that white flag won't be there. Say we got to pass by our home and by the apple tree just before we get to the depot. And, and he said, Preacher, the reason I'm so nervous and shaky, I'm afraid to look out that window. I'm afraid that white flag won't be there. The preacher said, Son, I'll tell you what you do. You just sit still and, and let me check and see if I can see the white flag. And Bishop Moore looked out the window of that train and just when they got inside of that apple tree and that home, that thing was covered with white flags and uh, white shirts and pillowcases and most any kind of white cloth they could get in sheets, they had tied on that apple tree. He came back and he said, uh, listen, son, said, don't you worry about a thing in the world because that tree is completely covered up with white rags. And that boy began to smile and said, thank God, I'm welcome back home. You know, there's been people that love God and backslid on God. And I've been so mean ungodly, they wonder whether or not the Lord will take them back. Now, if you have known God, you've been born again, God will take you back if you mean business. God will have the white flags out waiting if you'll come to him on your knees and ask God to forgive you and take you back in. God will do exactly that. God wants to do that. And then notice number four, that God uses very humble instruments. In verse three, there were four leprous men at the entering in the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? They said one to another, Why sit we here? Now these four men were leprous men. They had leprosy. They had been, uh, of course, uh, expelled from the city because it was against the law of the land for a leper to live on the inside of a little city because it was so contagious. And these four lepers lived on the outside of the city wall of Samaria. And if they saw anyone coming near them, they'd have to throw up their hands and cry, unclean, unclean, unclean. That meant don't come near me. No one was allowed to go near those lepers in those days. It was a disease that you could not cure and when a person contracted leprosy, he had to be expelled from home, from the village, and put out in a leper's camp or on the outside of the village. And these four men sat on the outside of that village. They got to thinking one day. They said, here we are on the outside of the village, and if we sit here, we'll die. There's no doubt about it. They said, if we just decide anyway to go on the inside of that village, said, we couldn't do any more than just starve to death there. Said, be no worse than starve to death here. If they kill us, they just they'd have to kill us. We're going to die anyway. Why do we sit here and we die? They said, not only that, the Assyrian army is camped all around uh, this little village. And the camp is just down the way. And we might just go down and see what's down there. Said, they might give us a bite to eat. And if they kill us, all right, we're going to die anyway. We've got nothing to lose. So those four men decided to go down and invade that camp of the uh, Syrians. And so they took off down to the camp. Now these men, when they started toward that camp, God Almighty created a terrible sound that sounded like the armies of uh, many small nations. And those Assyrians said, listen, we hear 
thousands of hoofbeats. We hear armies coming. Now these Samaritans, the Israelites, have gathered together the Egyptians and the Hittites and other surrounding nations, and they're coming in to capture us and kill us and uh, put us to death and destroy us, and we better get moving. They're almost on us now. They can hear that sound. They said, we don't have time to saddle our horses. We don't have time to get our donkeys. We don't have time to take any food. We don't have any time to get all our clothes. We better run for our lives. And that entire army of the Assyrians took off like they were, maybe some barefooted, maybe some in their night clothes. They had nothing. They cared nothing. They were so anxious to get away. On to the left, everything they had behind. And they were gone. When these four lepers came upon the scene, they couldn't believe what they saw. They saw the camp completely empty, not an Assyrian in the camp, not a one, completely empty. And they saw food, they saw clothes, they saw gold, they saw silver. They saw everything they wanted. And they eat and they eat they almost pop their stomachs and then they begin to hide that gold and silver. They picked them up some good, nice clothes. No doubt they hadn't had any decent clothes to wear. They dressed themselves up. Man, they were having a ball. God had provided that for them. And then they said, now listen, why do we do this? We have good tidings. Why don't we go back and tell the people in Samaria that we got some food down here, that they don't have to starve, that we have gold and silver, we have raiments, we have their needs. And so they carried the news of good tidings back to the uh, Samaritan village there and told the gateman that watched the gate, they said, you know, we have found all kind of food. And no doubt they saw the clothes they had on and, and different things they brought back and said, there's plenty of food down here in the camp. Go tell the king. And so they went and told the king. The king said, we got five horses left that hadn't starved to death. Get those horses ready. Take off down there and see whether or not these men are telling the truth. And they went down and found they were telling the truth. And these four men were humble instruments. Four lepious men being used of God to supply the need of these people here in this village. See, I don't care who you are, how old you may be, or how young, how well educated you may be, beloved, or how uh, illiterate you may be. God is no respect of person. And the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, God has chosen the base things of this world that no flesh should glory in his sight. God chose the four lepers that nobody could glory about this, and God used them. Number five, notice their joyful discovery. Their joyful discovery, verses 5 through 8. Now, I'll let you read that yourself. The Bible said they rose up in the twilight, went to the camp, and it tells you there, verses 5 through 8, their joyful discovery. Beloved, they were static. They went down there, they found food, they found clothes, they found gold, they found silver, maybe found medication, found a lot of things they needed, they didn't have. And what a joyful discovery. A lot of people today live out in sin, live for the devil, make their own road hard. The Bible said the the, the wicked is like the trouble sea ever casting up dirt in my. And when you come to God, you have a joyful discovery. We have a young couple in this church that's just saved recently. I baptized them last Sunday night. Uh, the McElroy couple, Sherry and Ron McElroy. They're going this weekend to meet some of their people in another state. And she told me Wednesday night, said, Preacher, we go on and tell them about Jesus. We're going to witness to our kin folks, and many of them are Catholics and know not God, but we go in and tell them about Jesus. I said, Sherry, you go tell them. We'll be praying for you. I said, we're going to do it. And she is rejoicing over the fact that they're going to tell some of their relatives about Jesus Christ. They had found the Savior, and they're happy about it, rejoicing about it, on fire for God, and wanting to tell others. They found a joyful discovery when they found the Lord. And so you must remember you can find joy and peace and satisfaction in Christ you can't find elsewhere. Number six, they made haste to pass on the good tidings. They said, why should we here till we die? Let's go now and tell the other people about it. In verse nine, they said one to another, we do not well this day as a day of good tidings and we hold our peace if we tarry till the morning light. 
Some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. If you're saved, you should tell others. These people, these four lepers, after they had eaten a good meal, dressed themselves up, enjoyed the camp, hid them some gold and silver. They said, why do we sit here? We have discovered these blessings. We need to go tell others about it. And the four men went back and told the starving village about what they had found. There's sinners out here died and going to hell. There's sinners out here starved to death, spiritually dead in trespass and trespassing sins. Nobody tells them about God. You have the good news. You have found the joyful things that God wanted you to have and you know that. And why do you sit around and not tell somebody else? Tell others about it that they too can enjoy good old time Holy Ghost salvation. God wants you to do that. Many people have been saved for years and never witnessed anyone. You ought to witness to people in your home, on your job, witness to your neighbors, tell people about Christ. You need to do it. People are dying and going to hell. They're starving and they're spiritually and they're dying without God. And if we don't tell them about it, then who's going to do it? Number seven, notice their successful testimony, verse 10. So they came and told them. And in verse 16, and the people went out. So they came and told them, and the people went out. When these four lepers came and told the starving people, well, they were so starved until they were eating dove's dung. They were so starved until they were eating uh, horses' or heads. And, and eating. One, one woman made an agreement with her neighbor, we'll eat my child today, and then we'll cook your child and eat him later. They killed her child and ate it, and the next day, the woman wouldn't give up her child. And she went to the king, the woman who gave her child up to eat, went to the king and told what the other woman had done. They wouldn't let him boil her child. And so she, uh, uh, the king, that made him so angry until he said, you let me get a hold of that preacher. If I can find that Elisha, if I can get a hold of that bald-headed prophet of God, I'll take his head from his shoulders this day. And when the sun goes down tonight, Elisha's head won't be on his shoulders. But it was. They blamed the man of God, but he was not responsible. It was their wicked sins that brought this terrible drought upon them. And so they got the good news. The lepers went back. They came and told them. God wants us to tell them. And verse 16, the people went out then to see what it was all about. Now, when you begin to tell people about Jesus... And tell people that you have a good church here at Northside. Enjoying the blessings of God. And God's with us. They'll come and see what it's all about. But you walk around and keep your mouth shut. And never say anything about it. They'll wonder whether or not. And what it's all about here at Northside. You got to tell them. Let them know about it. And they'll do something about it. Seven years ago in Nova Scotia. There was a man. He went out to the cemetery every week. Never a week could go by. But when he wouldn't go lay some flowers on a grave. Rain or shine, snow or sleet, he'd go lay some flowers on a grave there in the cemetery in Nova Scotia. Somebody went to him one day and said, Mr., we are curious to know why you go out here every week and lay flowers on a grave out there somewhere, on a different grave every week. Rain or shine, snow or sleet, you're out there laying a reef of flowers on somebody's grave. He said, Mr., it's like this. He said, I was a little boy on the big Titanic when it started sinking. Said there's no man on that Titanic. They put him on the lifeboat. The lifeboat was about right near the ship. And said I was up on deck about ready to go down and drown with others. And I was just a little boy. Said an old man said, sonny boy, I've done lived my life. And I'll soon be dying anyway. You jump in this boat and take my place. And I'll climb out and take your place. That old man climbed out and put that little boy in that lifeboat. And the old man drowned. This fellow that carried the flowers out now, he wasn't a little boy anymore. He'd grown to be an old man. He said, you know, we gathered many, many bodies out of the water out here and brought them and buried them right here in the cemetery that drowned because of that Titanic sinking. So I don't know which grave belongs that old man, but I, he died in my place and said, I want to put a flower on every grave. Watch the week on a different grave that I may be sure I lay some flowers on his grave. He took my place and died in my stead when he didn't have to. And as long as I'm able to walk, I'm going to bring flowers out here and put it on a grave so I'll be sure I get one on his grave. 
I appreciate the old man died in my place. You appreciate Jesus dying for you today, do you? I hope you do. Let's stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray you'll use the message. Thank you, dear Lord, for the good tidings. Jesus saves, keeps, and satisfies. Lord, have your way today. Blessing the invitation. We pray, our God, that Jesus might be honored here as we give the invitation. And Lord, speak to someone in the radio listening audience today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, while Deb is playing fast, listen to me closely. I don't know whether God spoke to you or not today. But if God spoke to your heart, you need to come down here and get right with God if you're lost, if you're a backslider, or if you want to unite with the church, or however that God may be speaking today. You obey the Lord while she plays. Go right ahead, David. While we wait, would you come? We'll help you if you'll come forward. If you need to get back into fellowship with God, you need to get saved, you want to join the church, for any reason that God is speaking to your heart, would you come? How about it? How about it, would you come? Only playing a couple of stanzas.